Okay, guys, we're going to get started. So if I can get you to just listen up for me, please, Year 12s. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for being here. I, you know, these are optional and it always blows me away how ready and willing you are to take time and to prioritise English. And I'm really, really pleased about that. So thank you so much for being here. Well done. Um, <laughs> you can give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> well done. Yay. Yay, you too. Um, but there's actually one person who I want to thank for being here even more, and that is the wonderful Xavier Verdnick. Now, give him a round of applause. Now, if you are... Un unaware of who Xavier is, if you have been living under a rock, Xavier was our school captain in 2019. <laughs> We're very clap happy today. Uh, he, I know that you, there's quite a few of you, particularly the fangirls at the front here, who've been very excited to see him to present, see him present today. And he's going to talk to you today about how to best study for English and some really specific stuff from an ex-student at McKinnon. And Honestly, if there is any revision lecture to go to this year, this is the one. This is the one. He's the speaker. He's far more impressive than any of us. Um, so let's give it up to him. So thank you, Xavier. So hello, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. Good to be back. Um, and yeah, looking forward to chatting to you guys about some English. Um, thanks for coming and um, feel free to pass um, any information on to any of the cowards who aren't here. Um, so um, today we're going to talk about, we're going to do two things. It's going to be split in half, this lecture. Um, the first half is going to be a little bit more didactic. I'm just going to talk to you about what I think you should be doing uh, to study for a Year 12 English exam. Study is obviously very personal, so if you guys have strategies, techniques that work well for you, it's probably not the time to throw them out completely. But these are the things that I think are important, okay? Um, and you guys have almost gone from year 9 to year 12, um, so if there are small gaps, that's okay. Um, there's plenty of time, and English is a subject that you can improve quickly in if you're working consistently, okay? Um, so we'll do that for the first half. We'll, we'll try and get through that in about uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions after that. And then we'll um, have a chat about some rear window content um, and some tips specifically for rear window. And if we've got time as well after that, we'll look through a scene together. Um, so you can see how I break down a scene. We can have a chat about some of the things we see so that you guys can see how you should be Extracting evidence from your texts, uh, because that's really important. Okay. So, if we have a look at the Year 12 examiner's rubric, okay, so each of your essays is marked twice, and each examiner marks it out of 10. Okay, and this is what the rubric looks like. Um, and for rear window, I've highlighted what I think are the important parts, okay? so. In both, so the three uh, dot points here, the bottom one is just on language mechanics. Can you spell? Can you construct sentences? Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but in the two points about content, complexity is what is highlighted. Okay, complexity is mentioned twice. And that's something we'll talk about with how you study, but you need to be able to demonstrate an understanding of how the texts are complex, how the ideas in the texts are complex, okay? And how you do that is very important, all right? That leads into the last part, controlled, cogent, and precise, okay? That's your language. So if you're gonna talk about complex ideas, you need to be precise with your language. We talk about how to write a rear window essay. Answering questions needs to be precise. If you're asked, what does Hitchcock say about something? Your topic sentence needs to be, Hitchcock says this, okay? You need to specifically answer the question with precise language, okay? The complexity we'll talk about in the content, um, but this is what's expected of you. If we look at comparative, same thing, okay? 
complexity of the texts, all right? Um, we won't go through the content on Comparator today, but it's the same idea, okay? You need to be able to extract evidence and show that you understand how the texts are complex and how you understand them, okay? And then again, for comparative, a sophisticated comparison from, so a sophisticated analysis from comparison, okay? So the idea in comparative is that through comparison, your analysis becomes more sophisticated, okay? So it's not enough to say how the texts are different, you need to say how they're similar and why that's important. And again, it's the same thing, okay? So different content, different tasks, but English is, uh, is looking for the same things. They're looking to develop students who are able to process information and understand what it means, okay? And that's why English is the most important subject because no matter what you're doing, okay, if you are good at English, you will understand how things work, okay? You won't be able to be manipulated. People won't be able to lie to you because you'll be able to understand when people pre present information to you, what is being said, okay? So, this is our criteria. How good is your writing? How well can you write? How good is your knowledge of the text? And then your command of writing conventions, okay? So how do we develop this? This is how you want to be studying. When you're studying, you're studying to develop a specific skill, okay? So it's really important that you have intent behind what you do because over the next two months, you're going to be really stressed. You're going to have practice exams to do for other subjects. You're going to have content to revise. You don't just want to be running on the treadmill doing busy work. You want to be really mindful with what you're doing that it is developing something specific, okay? So with English, you want to do different tasks to develop different things. Okay, so things to do, pretty straightforward. You need to write. If you want to get better at writing, you need to write. You also need to read, okay? And we'll talk about what you need to read. Um, reflecting, we'll talk about, and planning as well, okay? So those are the four tasks you need to do. You don't really need to do anything else. It's a pretty straightforward subject to study for. What you don't need to do, you don't need to reread the entire book more than once, okay? You do need to reread passages, but you don't need to reread the entire book. And learning quotes in isolation is a waste of time. You don't need to do it. Um, evidence is only useful in the context with which you can provide it in an essay, okay? What that means is you're not getting assessed on how many quotes you can regurgitate, okay? You're getting miles. Is this supposed to be a positive? Uh, okay. So... <laughs> Um, I did better than you in English. Um, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so specific and targeted in your study. Okay, so let's talk about some of the different uh, tasks you can do and what those tasks will address. Okay, so propositions. Okay, so in English, something that happens to a lot of students that is very difficult to overcome, and it's not a trivial thing either, is that writing a full essay is a challenging thing to do. It's mentally exhausting. It is, to a degree, emotionally exhausting as well because you have to sit there for several hours and you know when you're doing well and when you're not doing well. So to set aside that amount of time is difficult. And if you spend that much time on an essay and it's not good, it can be difficult to get back on the horse and write another one. You don't want to develop an all or nothing approach to your study in English, okay? You don't need to write essay after essay after essay after essay in order to get better at writing, okay? But you do need to be writing consistently. So writing shorter passages in response to prompts to practice how you're going to analyse a specific quote that you think is interesting and important is a very valuable tool to use. And within your paragraphs, um, you don't need every sentence to be... 100 out of 100. Not every sentence has to be an A plus sentence, but you do need to be able, if you want to access those high marks, to write really good sentences. To do that, you need to practice. So writing propositions, one, two sentences in response to a prompt, is a really good way to develop probably your higher end sentences, and it's something that I did quite a lot. Okay, paragraphs. You want to use these to develop your analysis, okay? So in terms of complexity, 
You need to be able to analyse different parts of a quote, of an example, of a film technique, of a scene. And the only way you do that is spending more time on one scene. Okay, so that's writing paragraphs. That's how you learn how to write complex writing. Okay, or maybe not complex writing, but be able to show that you appreciate the complexity of the text. Okay, so being able to go into detail on a quote is something that requires practice. You're not just going to be able to write more on the day because it means more. If you haven't practiced going into detail on information, you won't be able to do it. Okay, so that's what paragraphs are for. And then essays. So essays are for developing the direction of your piece. Okay, what I mean by this, when you respond to a question, okay, or to a prompt, you need to be able to form a interpretation of the text, okay? Form an interpretation of the text. To do that, you have an intro, three, four body paragraphs, and a conclusion, okay? In each of your body paragraphs, you touch on a different idea, a different aspect of the text, okay? We all know this. But good writing and good essays, yes, you're touching on different points, but the entire text is heading in one direction. It's heading towards that interpretation that you have, which you, which you mention at the end of your third paragraph in your intro and probably in your conclusion as well, okay? If you've done a good job in your essay, every sentence, every word you write is leading in that direction, okay? When I knew I'd written a good essay, it felt like the conclusion, the end of the third paragraph was writing itself because you've created, you've presented these evidence, you've presented these arguments, and so you want to get to the point where at the end of your essay, your interpretation is, oh, it's got to be that, okay? That's the obvious answer to the question, look at all the information I've provided. That's what writing full essays is for. It's for practicing the direction between paragraphs, how you build an argument to get to your overall point. That's what I think the place of writing essays as practice is for. You write them to practice that skill, okay? With that in mind, I would say you don't need to write your practice essays to time that often. Okay? Writing to time is important. You need to finish your essays. Okay? And most students, maybe not most, many students do not. So it's definitely a place where you can position yourself above other students around the state. So it's something to do. But you've got to be able to write well first. Okay? And so when you're writing essays, I would focus on writing good essays. Because on the day, you'll have that extra bit of juice. You'll be able to write faster you won't be able to necessarily write better. So when you're writing your essays, it's for practice. Okay, reading. This is something that I'm gonna guess few of you do, okay? So what you're expected to do in English, okay? You're expected to form an interpretation of the text. Does that make sense? We all know what that means, yeah? Okay. But you are not expected to reach that interpretation by yourself, okay? You're not. You're expected to present information, okay? So what do I mean by this? When we look at voyeurism in Rear Window, okay, there are different positions people can take on how Hitchcock presents this theme, okay? Does he present it as positive? Does he present it as negative? Does he, which he does, present it as a mixture of both? And how? Okay. It is reasonable to expect you to present an interpretation on that, but you don't have to get there on your own. You should be reading other people's essays. Okay. You should be asking people to read your essays. Okay. Because if you can take interesting ideas, interesting sentences from other people and introduce them into your own writing, they'll improve the quality of your work. Okay? When it says how to plagiarize, you do not you're not going to rewrite other people's essays, okay? Because you are not going to score well if you do that. Okay? The reason being is on the day you will get a question you have not seen before. Okay? And you will not be able to regurgitate an answer that answer that responds to the question. Okay? The most important part. The most important part of your essay is that it answers the question. If you're regurgitating stuff that you have written at home, it's not going to do that. It's going to be obvious. Okay, You can always tell when you're reading it and you're going to score poorly. 
What you can do is read other people's work, take good ideas, good sentences, and in introduce that into your own work. Okay, so if you want to develop your understanding of the text, you should be reading other people's essays. Okay, and you should be seeking feedback on your own essays as well. All right, you're not competing against each other for high study scores. Okay, when a school scores well, every student gets bumped up after the exam. Okay, every single one. All right, so it is in your interest for your classmates to do better. Okay, because you're not competing against this room, you're competing against other schools. You're competing against Melbourne High, you're competing against Halebury. Okay, so to do well, you want everyone to do well. Okay, so other people's essays, close readings of the texts, so film and the books, rereading those. And then as well, for Rear Window, I'm not sure about your um, comparative. You've obviously, you've got all the study guides online. They're okay, they're usually simple, but they're good to develop your understanding. But for Rear Window, there is so much writing out there on this movie, so much, okay? And it will take points of analysis that you have not considered. Some of it will be beyond what is expected of you, but if you can write better work from reading it, absolutely you should go looking for it, okay? So looking for university level pieces on rear window, you maybe you're not expected to write at that level, but you can touch on those ideas and again, steal sentences from here and there that you like, that you think add to an interpretation. Or even better, it'll give you a new viewing of the text that will change your own interpretation and you're able to develop a more sophisticated understanding of what's happening. Again, don't reread the entire book. You don't have the time. Um, really, you're only really doing that to tell people you've reread the book. So just um, reread passages is a better use of your time, okay? You've got to be disciplined with how you use your time because it is very finite at this time of year. So the place to go is uh, you just Google Scholar. Um, I don't think you guys have access to the university databases. So Google Scholar, Rear Window, Hitchcock. There you go. And there's probably 50, 60 pages of people writing this, okay? Some of it's good, some of it's not. You should be able to tell. If you're not sure, find your mate who does really well in English and get them to tell you, okay? Um, but you can see just in the abstracts beneath, okay, there are there is meta language, there is vocabulary that maybe you hadn't used and being able to read that, synthesize that information in your own writing is how you get better, okay? So yes, you have to make your own interpretation and write your own response, but you don't have to get to that point and develop your own understanding and develop your understanding by yourself, okay? It's important to be collaborative. Okay. So reflection, this goes on with being mindful, being really targeted with your study. After you write something, you need to actually think about what did I do well, what did I not do well? So the first part of that is actively doing it yourself, writing down what you're happy with, what you're not happy with, getting other people to read it, uh, excuse me. <coughs> and then the last one is just really abuse your teachers over the next couple of months. Um, they're going to mark everything you give to them. Okay, they will. Um, and I think if I was an English teacher, I would, I would love it when students come to me and give me work, okay? Your teachers want you to do well. They want you to be interested in what they're teaching. And if you ask for help, they will give it, okay? So you should be seeking feedback, ideally, on everything you write, everything, okay? Give it to them ask, can I see you tomorrow with feedback on this? Most of them will say yes straight away, okay? And that is the best way to get better, okay? Writing, getting feedback, and implementing the changes you need to do, okay? Um, if you're just writing and writing and writing and never thinking about what you're doing better, you're just gonna keep doing the same things wrong. Um, but you should be using your teachers and you should be using each other, okay? And getting your work marked, yes, it's a bit scary to seek feedback from your peers, but you're all here to get better and you should want to read your classmates' work as well. Again, because if you can take one or two good sentences from an essay, that's gonna improve your work a long way. There we go. 
Okay, so this is an example of how I uh, reflected on the essays I wrote. Okay, so um, you can see the days that they were written. Okay, um, you can look at the the, the topic and then each one we've got what's done well what's not done well and marks okay so to get better okay you need to be writing specifically again specifically what you're doing well and what you're not doing well okay it's easy to just cruise along and think you're going okay if you're not actively addressing what you're doing well what you're not doing well you're not going to improve, okay? So you should seek this kind of criticism, okay? Because it's going to make you better, all right? And when you get it, ask, okay, how do I, how do I address that, okay? Ask your teachers, ask your classmates. They will know, okay? They will know how to get better, all right? Um, cool. Okay, so a word on complexity and detail. Um, so your essays need to be able to touch on the complexity of the text, okay? Demonstrate an understanding of the complexity of the text, but they need to be easy to read, okay? Examiners spend five minutes, seven minutes on an essay, okay? That's all they're paid for. That's all they're going to do. So if your writing is not easy to understand, it doesn't matter how good your ideas are, you're not going to get access to those marks. So for every essay you write you need to be able to strip it back to its most simple and fundamental points, okay? So a really, really good task to do, and this is, so all we've done so far, this is on how you improve your writing, how you become a better writer, how you can make better essays. The other thing you need to do is have a really wide base so that when you get into the exam, it doesn't matter which topic you get, you're ready to go, all right? So you're not gonna write 60 essays, on every possible topic okay if you are if, if you do well done to you um, but you probably didn't need to do that so you write however many essays you can to develop your writing and then for your other topics you need to write you should be writing plans okay those plans you spend I would say when you're starting out six seven minutes on by exam time you want to be able to write out a plan for an essay in 90 seconds okay it needs to be quick Okay, because when you get into the exam, you want to spend as much of that three hours as possible writing. Okay, so again, you need to practice this. And one of the best things you can do for English, okay, is get in a group of five, well, I say four to eight, sit down, write plans, and then talk about them after and say, okay, this is how I would approach this question. This is how I would approach this question. And again, you're going to get access to ideas you might not have otherwise got access to. What a plan looks like, I don't have a plan here. Okay, what a plan looks like. Um, Matt Day, yeah. give me a, a rear window prompt, please. Uh, voyeurism is unethical. Okay, so we'll say Hitchcock presents voyeurism as unethical. Okay, so what does your plan look like for that? Okay, it looks like paragraph one, voyeurism is central to rear window. Paragraph two, voyeurism is harmful to both the object and subject of voyeurism. Paragraph three, the observation voyeurism provides can be beneficial to, to a community. Okay, that's what your plan looks like. It's simple, okay, and the ideas you present, okay, need to, you need to be able to reduce them to something that clear, okay, because if you can't do that, you don't understand what you're saying, all right? And it will be clear. It'll be obvious to the examiner. Um, that leads me into rear window. So that's the end of the how to study bit. Questions before we go on. Yes. I would say 
if you're in a rut or if you've stopped for a bit and you're kind of in that fear procrastination kind of area, I would say reading is less emotionally taxing than writing. So I would start with reading and writing propositions, doing smaller tasks and working up to big ones. I only wrote two or three essays for each uh, task between now and the exams, okay? Now, I should have done more um, and I kind of dropped the ball and had a breakdown like a week before the exam, but you can do well, okay, with, yeah, without doing that, okay? So that you should take heart from that because I've been in that position, definitely. So reading other people's work, reading um, information online is a good way to develop your skills without that. It's, it's a smaller emotional risk than sitting down to write an entire essay. You need to be able to do that, but that's what I'd recommend. Day before and day of, you should be either writing out a lot of plans in two minutes each or just looking over the plans you have written. Okay, I wouldn't be writing anything on the day before um, because, I mean, by the day before, you'd, you'd hope to be... You're not going to get any better at writing. You're not going to get any better at writing in the last two days, so I'd just be looking over what you have or you can write plans. Yep. Yes? When to start? Uh, you should start now. Um, so you've done your last sack. I think I remember I had about 55 days, 60 days, so it's what, about eight weeks. Yep, you should be starting now. How much to do? As much as you can. Um, but it's not about quantity so much as it is about quality. Um, and especially with English, a brute force approach doesn't really work. It probably, maybe with maths, okay, you can just smash out exams until the cows come home but with English you've got to be focused so as much as you can but keep it good if you can write or read something every day even if it's just 10 minutes a day you can get so much better so much quicker because I say there would be very few of you in here who have written something every day for a period of eight weeks before okay um, yes any more questions yep Um, you can rewatch the movie. I'd say if you're going to, I'd set aside like a Saturday to do it and do a really close watching. Um, if it's, if you cannot remember the movie, rewatch it once without doing anything and then go back and look at it see, scene by scene. It's something you can do. Um, because it is, that is a point with the text specific close minute knowledge of the detail is important but if you don't understand the big picture of how it is you can get away with it but i think if you've got that base to your analysis it makes things easier okay you want to make it simple for yourself and if you really understand what the author and director are actually trying to do and what it feels like to experience their work that's going to underpin your analysis really well Alrighty, um, so, rear window. This part is going to be, hopefully, a little bit more um, interactive. Um, so, we're going to talk a little bit about some different points of rear window that I want to get across that I think are important, and then we will look through a scene after that as well, okay? Um, and... Please answer your questions and put up your hands or I will pick people. Okay. So, um, okay. In a rear window essay that scores 10 out of 10, how many pieces of evidence do you think is good for a paragraph? Four? Okay, anyone else want to have a go? <laughs> I would say, in terms of pieces of evidence, you, could, you should, and the best essays will have eight to ten pieces per paragraph. Now, 
you are not going you're not going to analyze 8 to 10 and again these numbers are not like a checklist but a piece of evidence is a close up of Jeff's face that is softly lit while this sound is playing in this costume with this music. You've got four pieces of evidence there. Okay? So it's not eight to ten examples, but you need evidence. You need lots of evidence. And your evidence needs to be, again, specific. You cannot just say, in a shot of Jeff. Okay? That's not evidence. What you're saying is, hello, examiner. I don't know what is happening on the screen, but Jeff's there. Okay? It's not enough, okay? And it is reasonable at year 12 for the examiners to expect for you to label your evidence correctly, okay? For them, it is, it is fair for them to expect you to describe what you are seeing correctly as well, okay? So your paragraphs should be dense with evidence, okay? And that's where your ability to include evidence in your analysis is important okay so up until now it's probably okay to go topic sentence evidence analysis evidence analysis linking sentence that's probably not to access high marks to access good marks that's not enough you need to be able to include evidence in your analysis okay you need to be able to integrate quotes and techniques in every part of your writing okay so that's how this is done it's not easy to do, okay? Very, very few students can get to that point, but you should be aiming to fit in it as much evidence as you can, okay? Topic sentences, okay. This is just a point. Your topic sentences should not be more than a line and a half, okay? Should not be more than that. Your topic sentences need to be short, they need to be clear, and they need to be specific, okay? Gender roles in rear window. What's your topic sentences? Hitchcock demonstrates how the restrictive gender roles for women in the 1950s were damaging. Okay? That's all. Okay? They need to be simple. Your top, you're not going to get marks for analysing the texts in your topic sentences. Okay? What you are going to get marks for is if your essays are easy to read and easy to understand. So your topic sentences need to be short, they need to be clear, they need to answer the question, and they need to be simple, okay? You can spend your money on your nicer, longer, more complex sentences later on. Your topic sentences need to be simple, okay? And talk about varying your sentence structure, yes, but the biggest issue students have is not writing short sentences, it is writing is not writing long sentences. You can all write long sentences. You can't write short sentences. So if you're wanting to improve your writing, including more short sentences, is how to do it, okay? But topic sentences should all be short, okay? Alrighty. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about these four points and then we're going to look at a scene. Um, and then we're going to... Yeah, that's, that's it. Okay, so perspective... Does anyone know what I mean by perspective when it comes to rear window? You boys should all know. <laughs> what we're given to look at. That's a good point. That's one thing we definitely mean by perspective. Okay? So, can someone expand on that for Will Green, please? <laughs> Yep, that's true. So, how an individual interprets a scene or an event. So, in the film Rear Window, whose perspective do we see? Jeff's. Jeff's. What does that mean? We see Jeff's perspective. It's biased. it's biased, yes. So, is what we are seeing in Rear Window actually happening? Okay. Is what we're seeing real? This is something that you are going to have to... Reckon with in your writing, okay? You're going to have to assess the idea that 
what we're seeing is not real, okay? The characters we see are not actually the way they are, okay? What we see versus how the characters are are two different things, okay? Because we're not seeing the world as it is. We're seeing the world through Jeff's eyes, through his perspective. And so everything we see, everything that is presented to the audience is coloured by Jeff, by his personality, by his own biases, okay, coming from both within and without. So Jeff's biases, not only because of who he is, but because of how the world around him, the world has shaped him, okay? Good, all right? What are some other perspectives we have for this film, okay? Or interpretations. The other one I wanted to touch on um, before we start thinking about set and music, what do people from Hollywood love more than anything else? Yeah. People, people from Hollywood love more than anything else is people from Hollywood. So, movies, okay, the reason why, part of the reason why this movie is a classic, part of the reason why La La Land is a, is a classic, why it cleaned up at the Oscars is because these are movies about movies. They are movies about cinema, about what it is like to go to the cinema, okay? People who make movies think that making movies is the most important thing you can do, okay? So, a really important perspective of this film, a really important theme, a really point, important aspect is how Jeff's experience is similar to the audience, okay? Similar to us watching, all right? Throughout the film, there are many, many techniques, devices, symbols used to compare Jeff's experience with that of the audience, okay? What is the opening shot of Rear Window? Does anyone know? Blinds. Three blinds, three acts of a film. The ratio of the window is exactly the same as the ratio of that of a cinema screen. What's the last shot of the film? Blinds closing. Okay, Jeff looks out his window in the same way that the audience goes to the theatre. Okay, they go to escape, they go to create a story. Okay, and in that come some interesting ideas. Okay, if Hitchcock is critical of Jeff, is he also critical of the audience? Okay, and this is when you talk about complexity. If voyeurism is so awful, why is Hitchcock making a movie? Okay? So, what you need to think about is, okay, they're similar, but how are they different as well? Okay? Well, it's socially acceptable to go to a movie to watch a movie. That's what they're for. It's a bit more questionable to watch people without them knowing. Okay? That is a difference. Okay? These are also imagined characters. Whereas to Jeff, the characters are real, okay? These are important differences. The other key difference, okay, is that, and this is something that if you go and read those texts, is talked about a lot. Sorry, the, if you go and read the articles online, we know we're at the movies, right? We know we're at the movies. We know we're watching a movie. Jeff doesn't, and... If you rewatch the film, what you want to take note of is what are we shown that Jeff is not and why is that done? Okay, so you think about the scene where Jeff falls asleep and we see Thorwald leave the apartment with a mysterious woman. Okay, that scene, I would argue, is there to create some more tension. Okay, so is what we're seeing real. It's to remind the audience of that idea that this is an imperfect narrator or an imperfect perspective. Okay. The other important trope throughout the film is the shots of Jeff. Okay, the shots of Jeff from outside the apartment. That is something that is afforded to the audience that is not afforded to Jeff. Okay? Does someone want to have a guess at maybe why that happens? It's okay. I'm not going to yell at you if you get it wrong. Yeah, that's a hand. Well done. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, 
Alrighty. So, I'll, I'll give you what I think. So, the audience is given that to remind them of what they are doing, okay? You think about all the characters in the film, they're initially disgusted by what Jeff's doing. Lisa, Stella, Doyle, all the characters are shocked or outraged that Jeff would do this and then throughout the film they become more and more and more involved in Je with Jeff and what he's doing, okay? They all become excited by the mystery of Mrs. Thorwald, okay? And they become not just complicit but active in the process. They all become voyeurs. The audience is doing the same thing. We want to know what happens next. Okay? But every time Hitchcock takes us out and shows us what Jeff's doing, we're reminded, you know, this isn't great. This isn't ethical. Okay? We are offered that point of reflection that Jeff is not. Okay? And that's another difference in the perspective of the audience and the perspective of Jeff. Okay? So something you want to think about is the perspectives. Jeff's. Firstly, it's biased. It's imperfect. Secondly, how is it similar to that of the audience? Okay, that's something you want to compare. The last one is you can compare the perspective of audiences at the time, so as it was released, versus audiences now. Okay, very different social situations, there's going to be different interpretations. Okay? Um, possibly. Keep talking. Okay. This next one is just something, it's a, just a bit of a pet peeve of mine because I've, I've read a lot of year 12 essays since I graduated. Observation, voyeurism. Not the same thing, okay? They're not the same thing. So if you want to say in your essay that voyeurism is good, you can. But if you want to say it's good because it's observation, it's not, okay? Voyeurism is, you have to, for it to be voyeuristic, Okay, it's implied that there is some kind of gratification, sexual or otherwise, from doing it. Okay, observation is just watching. Okay, and that's different. The two are linked because through voyeurism, there is inevitably observation. But Hitchcock can condemn voyeurism as unethical in all situations, while still conceding that observation has benefits. The two can happen at the same time, okay? I don't think voyeurism is good. You might. Um, but if you're going to make that point, make the point that voyeurism is good. Don't make the point that observation is good because they're not the same. And um, if you, again, that's a really easy way to show that you understand how it's complex, okay? Because you're showing the examiner, look, we learnt, we all learned voyeurism as a word this year, okay? and it's in all our essays, but if you can show that it's different to observation, you're gonna to say to the examiner, look at me, I've actually thought about this and come up with an interpretation. <laughs> okay, um, last two points before we look at a scene, okay? And um, I might have to call on people after we watch the scene, because um, you're not overly talkative. Um, who can tell me about the set? Yes? Okay, that's a good point. It was, in, it was constructed. So, the film is set in New York, but the film, the, it was filmed, I'm pretty sure, in LA. So, biggest set ever built. So, why that's important is everything in the set is intentional. Okay? It's not a coincidence. Everything is intentional. Okay, good. Did you have something to say as well? His apartment is small and claustrophobic. And that is important because part of why Rear Window is a masterpiece is because it is unique in its storytelling, okay? Every police show that has been made since Rear Window has done a Rear Window episode, okay? It is a unique method of storytelling and it's central to the film, okay? That's what the film is based on. Okay, yep. All of it's from Jeff's bedroom, that's good, okay? What we see, okay, we are tethered to Jeff's apartment like he is, okay? That's good. 
that's another way that Hitchcock mirrors the experience of the audience with the experience of Jeff. Who can tell me about the layout of the courtyard? Yep. Yes, social hierarchy. So people who are higher in the social hierarchy of the time or in Jeff's estimation are higher in the apartments, okay? The single women are lower, okay? Uh, except for Miss Torso um, because she's an object of Jeff's sexual desire. She is higher placed than the sculptor um, and Miss Lonely Hearts who Jeff does not look favorably, favorably upon. Okay, who's opposite Jeff? Thorwald. Why is Thorwald opposite Jeff? Yes, because they are the same, okay? They are the same both through Jeff's eyes and through Hitchcock's construction, okay? Jeff fears that his relationship to Lisa will be the same as Thorwald's relationship to Mrs. Thorwald. Okay. Perhaps that is why he is hesitant to enter into a serious relationship with Lisa. The other thing as well is Hitchcock offers so many examples throughout the film of how Jeff and Thorwald are similar. Okay? One that is quite explicit is when Jeff is sitting in his room in the dark mm -hmm. and he's on the phone to Lisa and she says, what's Thorwald doing? And he says, he's just sitting there in the dark. Okay? So... The two characters are similar, okay? And that's another way that the film creates tension because we are reminded, it's obvious to us that they're similar. Jeff can't see it, okay? So this also raises the question, is Jeff the good guy? Has Thorwald done anything wrong? Okay, what about who is... Okay, this is a bit more specific. Um, who can tell me some characters that we see very rarely. Yep, good, really good. That's what I was getting at. Why don't we see them? Is what? It's not accurate. I don't mind that. Yeah, it's not interesting. It's not what Jeff wants to see, okay? And that is central to Jeff's personality is that he seeks excitement. He seeks rush, okay? You think of his job. He's a photographer and yet he goes into the middle of racetracks, okay? He could just go sit in the woods and take photos of trees, but no, he went onto a racetrack during a crash, okay? He's not interested by the normal, okay, the ordinary, okay? Um, and this is, a, this is an aside, but if you're talking about gender roles or Jeff's view on marriage, Jeff fears marriage, right? That's clear. And he also doesn't think it works or he thinks when you're married, your relationship gets worse, okay? And he focuses on all of the problems in his neighbors' lives, okay, regarding their romantic relationships. But that's clearly a choice because he has neighbors who are happily married in happy families. He just doesn't focus on them. Okay, so much of Jeff's issues with marriage, you could argue, are of his own making. Okay, um, the last point is music. We'll talk about that and sound design as well. And that's something, if you're going to rewatch scenes, I'd pay attention to because it's something you can miss the first time around. The theme of the film, okay, is in the musical theme. Does anyone know what it's called? Lisa. Lisa Lisa's song. Mm, that might be relevant. I don't know why. Um, and that's what the artist, that's what the composer is playing. Um, and he doesn't finish it until the end. Hmm, I wonder if there's some significance in that. So, pay attention to when you hear that, okay? Think about how Hitchcock is drawing comparisons to Lisa throughout, okay? Like how Jeff 
what we're seeing is not real. Jeff projects not only himself, but those around him into the character's opposite, okay? I.e., the men in the courtyard represent versions of Jeff, the women represent versions of Lisa. Okay, now, let's have a look at a scene and we'll finish up. Okay, so we're gonna watch two minutes, three minutes. There is enough in this two, three minutes to write an essay on. So I want you to pay close attention to the things we have just spoken about, okay? We've spoken about perspective, we've spoken about set, we've spoken about music, anything else you can find, go for it as well, okay? But I want you to pay specific attention to those and we'll talk about it afterwards. What do you want from me? Okay. Someone break that down for me. Yep. Like it. Good. Good. And that's something that's really important. You need to be able to draw comparison between points here and points at... And, evidence from other parts of the film, okay? That's a really high level skill you need to be able to do, okay? Good. Yep, and we'll talk about this shot in a minute, okay? But I'll leave the point of darkness with you to think about, yep.
I like it. Um, that's a really good point. I think it's something where even if it's not intentional because, you know, it's exposed, you'd think there'd be better places. That's where he goes. Really good point. Yep. <laughs> good. We've touched on it, so we'll, I'm going to hear more from all of you. Darkness. What else is significant about this shot compared with the rest of the film? Who said that? Facing away from the window. Nice. That's good. We haven't really seen this shot angle before. What could this angle be? He's being watched by someone. Good. Who's he being watched by? Thorwald. So we see Thorwald's perspective. Okay. So much of this film is from Jeff's perspective and so much of it's actually in first person. It is noteworthy whenever we depart from that structure okay so with that in mind jeff's covered in darkness and we're watching him from thorwald's perspective how can we marry those two up anything about thorwald's perspective yep yep that's right so to thorwald jeff is this mysterious meddling force that's getting in the way of his plans but he's not clear okay he is to a degree a mystery these two haven't actually interacted and what is significant about what happens when Thorwald enters the apartment he's in darkness and then he steps into the light and we can see his face okay that is significant as well well actually I'll see if we can get there okay what else what else do we have yep It's definitely a point where Jeff... It's definitely a point where Jeff kind of packs his dax because he realises that it's becoming, like, a problem. You know, he's in danger now. How can we build on that? Or, again, any other points? I saw hands over here. Yep. Yep. I'll challenge you on that. The point's right. Okay. He is experienced... It's the first time that Jeff experiences danger. But what happens just before this? Lisa, right? So, Jeff is very happy, content to let other people live out their lives and experience danger and not intervene. Okay? We see that with Miss Lonely Hearts. Okay, he's happy to watch. Okay. This feels different because it is happening to Jeff. Okay. If you're comparing, again, the perspective of the cinema goer to the experience of Jeff, Jeff's experience is very similar to a cinema goer, to a, the audience of the film, up until this point. Because now the consequences for him are real. The people are real. He only realizes that when he himself is in danger. Okay, that's a key, that, that, I'd say that's a criticism of Jeff, okay, that he's that kind of self-absorbed, that none of the risks of the film are realised until this happens, okay, good, yep. No, that's a really good point. Definitely. I think um, when Lisa is being, um, you know, grabbed by Thorwald and we see Jeff and he's really, you know, stressed, it's de I think he definitely starts to realise um, or get worried 
or realize that he's been doing the wrong thing or at least that bad things are starting to happen definitely um but jeff i i guess the difference here is this is the first time that jeff himself is in danger okay and while he may be worried about lisa or sorry he's put her in that position he still did right he was happy to let her go he was happy to let uh stella go okay until it happens to him this is the first time where he is the active character okay active passive something else for you to think about um because it's a classic question in the exams about who is who's the hero of the film anyone else got anything good yep The what? Pink pajamas. pink pajamas. I don't know about the pink pajamas. Definitely the pajamas are significant. Um, the cast as well. The pajamas are significant. Um, you know, what, actually, if you can, if you can argue that, that's totally. What I always thought about with the pajamas is, think about how the young, uh, marriable women are dressed in the film, how they are costumed, and compare that to how. The married women and the men are costumed, okay? Um, Lisa is always in something, you know, um, you know um, yeah, sophisticated, almost as an exhibition, whereas Jeff is in um, uniform, plain pajamas. Stella is never really in anything that extravagant. Um, and then you can also look at the costumes of Miss Torso and Miss Lonely Hearts as well. Did anyone pick up on the sound? Yep. Yeah, there's a lack of sound. And particularly, there's only the sounds of the world of the film. Okay? And that is a key thing because we talked about how there's that comparison of the experience of the cinema goer or the, the audience versus the experience of Jeff. Those two are kind of blurred together because a lot of the music of the film, it's not clear whether it's diegetic or non-diegetic because is it coming from the composer's apartment but then it kind of, it starts that way and then it's clear that it's kind of beyond that as well, okay? In this scene, when it becomes real for Jeff, all that stops, okay? And that's another example of how those two perspectives are different. Yeah, cool. Um, cool. Cool. That's it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for having me. Hey, guys, can we give Xavier a huge, huge round of applause for that brilliant presentation? You are six weeks out from the exam. Six weeks. You can go, Year 12. Thank you so much. And Douglas has all my info, so if you want to message me or whatever, go for it.